in the exhibition space itself can be the major action in giving it shape and meaning. Once upon a time, frames were huge, ornate and expensive and impossible to uh, ignore. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Would you? Oh, would it you reads really it? well. So, they was, there, she's been saying this is superfluous uh, and expensive and as part of the image itself. In designing the show, a fine line appears in overstructuring the exhibition that it loses, so that it loses empathy, uh, i.e. to see the humans in the picture. Too much styling may present the artwork as a Hollywood movie, or worse, as banal advertising hoarding. One must focus the political statement of one always has a wider meaning than a singly. It's not just singly, it has a wider, wider meaning. So I'll read this to you and bore you, because it's just very... Oh, no, too, can I just jump in? We've got this awesome light. Oh, okay. It's yeah. the last day here. Yeah. We, can we just do this? this yeah, start? sure. What do you want to say? But I'm happy to keep going through that well, tonight. <coughs> I was forced to come on this trip. Yeah, yeah, they will not pay me. They will. Something. Are they going to pay me for this shit? Have we got our list of questions? Did Jude now? get that thing? Did Jude get your thing? Oh, you don't know. I think I don't know if I have to print out another one yeah. before you leave tomorrow. <laughs> she said when she sent it through, she didn't send it all the first time. Anyways. Can you put oh, pop mine up? Oh. Can you pop that up? Yep. Yeah. Do you want it super hot or you'd have to just have the water in the kettle as it is? Uh, hot. It'll only take a minute to heat it. Uh -huh. With the direction on Mike, we won't get any of that background, so... It'll be a nice subtle undertone at the back. Okay. Um, I guess because we wanted to write that sort of longer essay intro to you, so this is like a guide to help you sort of write that. Um, where were you working at the time that you found out about the ramen getting job? And yeah, when did you apply for it? Well, yeah, what was going on then? I originally applied, I originally applied for a, a, the position of art and craft advisor on the island of Middle Gimby, which is just off the coast here, several, say 10 kilometers away from the coast here and um, I got that position and I used to visit here to buy art when uh, the art advisor left here oh, right. and they had problems and then in 1981 I was sacked uh, by a right wing council in uh, Ramat Millingimby and so I came here. I actually went to Manangwita first. They, they offered me six months' work or a year's work, and then I left there to come back here because their bureaucratic um, social engineering was to to only have two art centres in in Arnhem Land, and they were Manangwita and uh, and Urukala. and so we would be out of the picture altogether. So I just quit there and I came here to live. And I lived, uh, they gave me a house here. Oh. And the people said, we want you to be here. And they actually petitioned, the whole community petitioned the Australia Council <laughs> that they fund the position for me here. They hang on to those records. Hopefully they've still got a copy of that somewhere. Yeah, it should be in, in uh, the Australia Council records. And they put thumbprints to everyone. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing, isn't it? How can you knock that back? Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, that wasn't the end of it, but then it took a long time, about six months, where I worked for nothing. Uh, we did apply for the Dole, or unemployment benefits, but that that was uh, it just took forever to come through. Mm. And in the end, we never got that. Uh, I was living here with a partner then. Mm. And uh, so six months or something, we were living on charity, which is funny here, but well, the community helped us a lot. They gave us food and they, they gave us a lot of problems too. 
in, yeah. in, the, in the sense of the running the art centre, there were arguments over prices and things, the usual thing that happens in those deals. Um, but uh, the majority of artists and that really took to us with a uh, really, uh, you know, really took to us and but they, we had the trust of them and um, we socialised with people. Um, we didn't think the town was different maybe, but we would, like in the twilight, we would walk around the town and we would actually stop at people's houses and have a cup of tea with people. Mm. And it wasn't because we were pretending to be some sort of colonial authority or anything. But people would just say, oh, come, you want a cup of tea or something? So I'd go and sit with people. And there, the thing was here, there's a very sophisticated society here. There's a man called Ray Munuel, and he'd been on the NAC, the National Aboriginal Conference, or Congress, that was like the ATSIC of the time. So he'd been to Canberra, he knew lots of people. He knew a lot of my brothers and sisters he'd met. Yeah. And so he, uh, he was, you know, he was a white, somewhat of a wider vision of this place. Um, and John Byer, there's another man who was here, lived here then. He used to be at Millingimby and he came here to live. He went to China with Gary Foley and Chica Dixon uh, <laughs> to meet Jam and Mao and so on. Yeah, no uh, Bishop wow. went to photograph that, didn't Yeah, he? yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And then there was David Gorpel, of course, was here. That's right. And a number of other people here that travelled with him. And uh, the, the dollar note painter was here, the person with the dollar note painter, and um, people weren't un 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 um, sophisticated or not, uh, not uh, informed about the world. <laughs> so they were uh, much more aware. The man who was the, what they call the community advisor, who really had the position of like town clerk, but he then engineered to teach a local person to be that town clerk. And he said, you know how to read and write, you know how to do all these things. Uh, this person will do the bookkeeping for you. You know how to make these decisions, you know how to run a meeting. Mm. And he let people do that. And uh, he encouraged, not just let them, he encouraged people to do things. So he was also for me going through all these motions and uh, how to fight uh, the state or the bureaucracy. So a lot of people now think, oh, you don't start up an argument with the bureaucracy or that, but um, ultimately you've got to remember that who your service serving, and it's not the big Australian uh, stupid parliament in Canberra, there's people here who may have a particular, well certainly here they've got a different view, they have a different view of the world and religious spirituality and informed or consciousness of the environment and the land than anyone in Canberra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see that just yeah. a couple of days. And so that, um, that sort of uh, really enriched me and it was, it was incredible to be here. Did you know early on you were going to stay for you know 10, 15 years, or no, did that sort of gradually happen? Yeah, all that sort of unfolded. Uh, I remember somebody um, I was talking to about in the eighties, and they said, "Yeah, you're just in a you're really in a rut." That's what you are. That's how she saw it. So it was a teacher or somebody, a non-Aboriginal person. And, she said, you're really in a rut here. And um, I just thought, this is like living in paradise. Why, why am I in a rut? Like, what, what would I learn or how can I enjoy my life more than here? Uh, you know, I just, I had the people, I walked, you know, walked to work. I knew everyone in the town. Everyone in the town would say hello to me going to work. Um, I had uh, people who really trusted me and vice versa and uh, we would travel, people would say, oh we're going to this thing, do you want to come? So you just travel on the truck with them, you don't drive, you don't say I'm in charge of this, I'll take over. Just, you just travel with people and uh, people respected your space and that um, and there was, a, it was like a completely different world. 
sorry, and that's why that attempt, that's why I end up staying and staying and staying, uh, because it became even richer and richer every year, became more and more profound and affecting life, attitude changing more than, um, and you just wanted to see how people were going to adapt to what was being forced on them, mm. because the world was sort of changing outside and it was Aboriginal out, people outside of here as much as non-Aboriginal people were just as much an enemy of this place as anything. They had peculiar ideas about how these people should live and how they should change. Did it take a while to like earn some people's trust? You know, easier than others? Or? Uh, some people, answer. yeah, some people wouldn't, didn't know. Well, oh yeah, they'd say, oh yeah, we don't know him. Or, but then I, they realised I'd do something, and they'd say, oh yeah, that's really amazing. And then they'd say, and other people would say, oh yeah, he'll, he'll look after you, or he'll do the right thing. And also, it's a bit of a fantasy position. They say you can be here and become a. I'm just trying to think of the word they call it, um, where you have a fantasy about you're the king or you're the something. Oh, yeah. And that, uh, what do they call it, a heart of darkness sort of yeah. thing oh. where you you, uh, you come to a place and you become... A god complex sort of, like a god complex. Like yeah, that, uh, well, maybe not as much as he was, <laughs> but you, you certainly, you're a long way from anything and no one, the bureaucracy and other people used to try and drain you in and say you can't do this, you can't do that, but they, they you could just say oh well there's no phone, the phones are out or the, or the unless they came here the mail didn't come or you're so far away from anything and um, but on the other hand I could also do things in Germany or somewhere and, and just if you keep doing successful things, uh, not, there's not much people can say against you. Yeah. Um, and certainly in a Western sense, to in the West, in the Australian art world, to keep doing successful things was something else that was to be seen. Um, so therefore, it was hard to be critical or overly critical of you. Um, even though that sort of, um, which word, I'll forget about the thing of, they call it, it's like a mental condition that's described as being that you're living in a fantasy world. But it's, um, that might be, be like if I was living here in a monastery no, uh, that wouldn't be, uh, if I was here in a living in a Christian monastery, if I was here living in a Buddhist monastery, that would be totally accepted. Mm. They may not, well, not totally, but it would be. <laughs> People would go, oh yeah, he's in a monastery for, yeah. Because you also must have made some really good friends at that time too, like lifelong friends even being adopted into families and stuff too. That's right, you have very long, long lifelong friends and you see their kids, people with their kids grow up or their people go through lots of different trials and tribulations and travelling with people to international places and that you see people's characters reveal. Yeah, that's hard. And, uh, uh, you know, true characters come out and um, the, um, I became about halfway through that, uh, most probably came a lot more hard line on some things. I just said, well, I won't accept that behaviour or this behaviour as before. It's just oh, yeah, it's all a rock and roll tour or something. Yeah. But you very quickly say, well, look, that's uh, not good for Aboriginal art and politically. It's not very good for Aboriginal people, period. Sure. Uh, for this to happen. So I said, look, these are touring rules, and if you follow them, that's fine. I said to people, and if you don't follow them, I'll just leave. And you can find your own way home. I don't want to know about it. If you want to know, it, you uh, just and I just come to that because uh, there were just some insane yeah. things that happened that were totally insane on any level. Uh, insane on this 
outside society, but I'm totally, totally insane on this society in here. You never do things what some people and myself or what we did, but just I just decide uh, that's not how it's got to operate. God, because you did have some massive projects sort of juggling at once. There was the like Parliament House Commission, the power bequest, yeah. um, even the other sort of exhibitions afterwards. I mean, mm. I don't know if you explained it one time before, but just sort of like, there was eight different sort of big assemblages that you were putting together over a, a mm. certain number of years. Mm. Yeah, it was, uh, that's right, it's a kick, I was The, um... The, um... Well, we're doing the Power Institute. Uh, no, there were, there were... Yeah, maybe I just that one. Yeah, Power Institute mm -hmm. thing. That was all right, that was being done. Um, so did you know that they were going to acquire it or it was initially it was about that exhibition? The exhibition, yeah. yeah. And then they decided, oh, we were, I didn't, wasn't totally aware of that change happening <coughs> within the institution, the debate that was happening. So I met all these players like Terry Smith and other people that were there mm -hmm. and they were becoming more like to, into what they are now, mm -hmm. being international art writers. Mm -hmm. And they, um, that debate was going on, and then they, when it shifted, suddenly it shifted, and they came on board and said, "Yeah, this is really great that Aboriginal arts in this uh, position, and it's really great this Aboriginal arts now going to shift into this other consciousness of things." Now, um, so that where it's got to go yet, I still don't know. That's. <laughs> Well, I don't know, I don't care in that way. I care, but I uh, just think uh, you can't predict what happens. But um, it just needs to maintain some sort of steadiness. So if you have a good idea, as I was saying before, a uh, good idea, good ideas are like scarce as hen teeth, yeah. and they're inspired by your environment, but they are very, and if they're simple about something, simple things, um, that's how you uh, try to maintain, or oh, I've got this idea and I'm trying to keep this as a steady, simple idea. And then, <clears throat> and I started to think about, somewhere along that line, I started to think about, well, what are people looking for in Aboriginal art? And there's a man, Peter Cook, who used to be at Matt and Greta, and there's another man, Steve Fox, at Uricala. They're not Aboriginal people, but they... Um, we used to have those discussions, well, what are people really looking for in art? Or what are they looking for in Aboriginal art? Are they looking for primitive things? Are they looking for um, things with figures? Uh, there's another line of thought is that uh, we've got to free people from being Aboriginal or from a tradition. There's a big move that that's the correct way to go, is to free people from that. So instead of people like David Malang, he's painted all his life in this four colours and then say, oh no, we'll give him all these other colours and let's see what happens. And I think, well that's alright doing a monkey experiment in a laboratory but that's literally what you're treating people like. Yeah, it's manipulation. Because they, he would, uh, he's travelled, he travelled around the world, he travelled to New York, he's travelled to lots of places, from, you know, to Tonga and Fiji and yeah. whatever, and New Zealand and New Guinea, and lots of other places, and then to <coughs> sort of say, and seen lots of contemporary art exhibitions, or Western art exhibitions, contemporary and otherwise, and he's got an idea about what he wants to do. And um, he, uh, just to think that he doesn't, uh, can't make decisions or be influenced and make decisions about those influences affecting him. And let alone uh, that some junior art person with little art training and reality can 
some junior art person with actually with little Western art training, mm. without even a PhD or anything else or whatever, can t teach him, uh, someone who has four wives, I don't know how many kids, uh, and he maintains that uh, family, the family, he can maintain the family without everyone having killing each other. He's most probably killed people in his life and had taken part in really incredible wars uh, and yet someone um, who most probably hasn't even got a boyfriend or a girlfriend turns up and starts to say, I'll, I'll teach you about life, mm. um, which is, and you're talking about somebody's art expression comes from their personality and their consciousness and someone will come here and start to teach someone and say, oh, you should be doing this. like. Uh, they might just have another consciousness, another awareness of life that you must probably you've never achieved. That's that's um, you know they speak and the other yeah you know, speak ten languages. Uh, oh, it's criminal. Yeah, right? it's criminal. It's what's naive and it's vain. It's you know it's really vain of someone to come in and say I'll teach you about that. And that was the attitude I took. I would go and ask them what do you want to do. Do you want to sing or dance, or do you want to do this or that, or uh, and to set up a project that you, you want to go out and meet these people, mm. or do you want to do a painting, or do you want to do weaving, or do you <clears throat> you can have a weaving exhibition, or you can have a weaving workshop, uh, and that way there's you can get more money for uh, more people to travel uh, that way, uh, those kinds of things, and try to put Aboriginal social mores into things as much as you could understand them. Anyway, that's a long way to end. No. no. I mean, just to, um, David Malangi, can we talk a little bit about that, the commissioning of the canoe? Was that something he was already uh, yeah, doing, yeah. or did that just fit perfectly with the power one? Or? No, there was a, in the Melan Gimby collection, as it was called, there's a museum set up there. Oh, yeah. One of the things that they did, uh, the uh, headmaster there, uh, I think, and the art advisor, they knew that uh, things were changing a lot, etc. And they th knew that uh, there hadn't been a canoe made, that people could make dugout canoes. And they thought, well, we should. Uh, uh, commissioned one and so they made one for the Mill and Gimby collection and when we came here when I came here with my partner here we then thought we should uh, we'll commission a canoe to be part of the collection and it's part of the naming because it's part of a tree it's a tree it's specific species of tree okay. uh, in fact he'd marked this tree with a big M like he'd cut a big M into the tree when it was little and it grew. So everyone knew not to touch that tree. Wow. So it's and it's a sort of a softer timber. It's not quite balsa wood, but it's it's a softer timber. So it made it easier to cut, but it's still a <clears throat> really massive undertaking and also like the balance, like I said, that so that sat regular in the water it didn't, wasn't an angle or yeah. things like that. There were uh, lots of things and people said, oh, I could do that. Lots of people then said, oh, I can do that, I can do that. Mm -hmm. But no one ever did. Um, and then we, um, we made another canoe. For another, someone asked us to commission a canoe, so we did mm -hmm. for someone else. And that was the second one that they made. Okay. And that went into a, an art gallery in down near Circular Quay. I don't know where it ended up really. I think wow. it ended up in the Australian Museum. Maybe, okay. Yeah. So was the, the the composition of the power collection, was it a collaboration with the community? Like, did you just discuss the idea of the exhibition and what would go in it with the community? And every, did you all decide together how it, how you mm. would? Well, I've had separate, of work. lots of conversations. Yeah, because how long actually did it take? Because it's a lot of work. There's like 250. Yeah, but works I started to collect it before I left Millingimbi. Yeah. And then it's a, once you actually have the idea in your head, um, then you can shape it. Many, then you see it every day. People would bring things in, 
and you think, right, well that's another species of tree. Like one day this woman brought in a whole thing of sticks that were coated in ochre, they were clear, and they were tied up like a fascage, you know, like fascists, the Romans have all those sticks tied together. That's the fascist fascia, which is about united, we're strong, and divided, we, we can be just broken. And that's the Roman symbol. But anyway, but um, that wasn't the symbol of this woman. She brought these ones in and said, oh, these are fire sticks. And uh, so we just thought, oh, well, that's another species, that's dutchy, that's another species of tree. Um, so one day we saw these people make red ochre from yellow ochre, from yellow clay. And so we, they showed us, and they said, we wrap it up in paper bark, and they showed it to us. And so uh, we wrapped that up and took a uh, paper bark, that's a paper bark tree, uh, is the idea. That that's another species of tree. And once you're alive to the thing and you keep telling people this is what we're doing, whether they're really taking it, whether they're really taking it on board is another thing. You've just got to keep repeating it to people. We're going to do this show and we'd show them like, what do you call this? Is this Ducci or <coughs> is Ducci like, um, is Ducci a Darpa, which is a tree? which is tree, like woody stems, or is it herbaceous, is it uh, mulmu, which is grass, which is herbaceous, it's an herbaceous stem. We'd ask people, do you call this mulmu or you call it darpa, and then we'd ask them, well where is that, is that in the forest or where is it? And you'd get, keep this conversation going, so they thought, well they were, not thought, they, no, they thought it, they were teaching, teaching you lots of things. And um, and you'd see like this fine set of spears came in. I thought, well, all right, well, I'll put that in there from this particular other kind of timber. I'll put them into the mix. Uh, or uh, paintings of really obscure things. There are lots of other paintings we could have had. We could have, we did not add the mosquitoes and the insects to it. That's another classification of animals or, or creatures. So we didn't put that in, and we didn't have worms or maggots or that sort of thing, yeah. or pa uh, you know. Um, so trees. There's that trees and grasses. Yeah. 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 So originally I put it into that according to that rudder definitional the rudder setup that he'd spoken with all these people in Gallowinko and put that together. So I used it. I put all these are the birds and this is the bats, these are the furred animals with the kangaroos, bats, the bandicoots, all that, that sort of thing. And these are the bony fish and these are the cartilaginous fish. So I, I put it according to that and then when it, the MCA opened, one day I was reading some book about mangroves and, uh, <clears throat> and they said, look, there's a room that's empty for this exhibition. We, the exhibition didn't use all those rooms. There's one room empty if you want to do a, um, what do they call it, something, exhibition, a project exhibition. So that means you think of an idea and you put, you can put furniture in there, you can put something about an idea or a style or period in art. So I put all the artwork that was from the mangroves, so I put that into that room and it was just stunning. Mm -hmm. And so then when it came to do the exhibition at the MCA, I put it into environments. Okay. So there were words too. They said Lathrapoi, which means from the mangroves. Ninjiapoi, which means from the plains. Or Richapoi, which means from the jungles. And so Gilchipoi. These are cot words. They're words that people use all the time. Yeah. And then I looked up other studies, like Reese Jones and other people, these anthropologists from Men who did their studies halfway between here and Milling and Menangrita. Yeah. And other people that did lots of studies in uh, in uh, Milling Gimli. Yeah. Some of them were good and bad. I mean there's that huge anthropological history is sort of shared with the early collections. 
which was sort of looking at this space as well. The, <coughs> the <coughs> the yeah. Like the, the burnt Yurikala paintings, and yeah. the photographs and different sort of things. But um, mm. what did anyone locally sort of think about Anthony? I didn't think it was that bad because that was the, this, that, like that book, the Urinal Science book from Rada, that's used in school. And see in there, but this is they had bilingual education here, so people were using that kind of knowledge in their teaching. Um, that was uh, not entirely, they weren't giving straight uh, science things, but they'd be talking about people and species and so on, um, and seasons and whatever. So that was in use, it wasn't, I wasn't speaking to people about their social life particularly or anything else. <clears throat> I, was, I was just talking about things that they talked about commonly. Yeah. Um, but anyway that was that sort of came together and um, we bought it. That, well the thing was all those common objects that we didn't really have to pay a lot of money for them really because they were common utensils and things yeah. that people did but there were, there were some things that were really our left field like this hook like a shepherd's crop yeah. to get the pandanus out of the tree and this other stick with a noose on it and I said what do you use that for and they said oh if a goenna runs up the tree we put that on their head and tighten it and then we pull them out of the tree and I thought that's really amazing you know mm. and they were obvious tools that people had used or did make. Uh, One thing know. that's interesting to me about that, because I've come from that cultural, more of the cultural collections yeah. side of things rather than art, is that then some of those very utilitarian, still beautiful aesthetic objects are, are described as a sculpture or a, mm. like a spear is a sculpture or mm. did you think of them as art when you were collecting them or you, mm -hmm. yeah yeah well okay. that's when we were started uh, yeah because that's in a way one of the first times that that happened mm. that things mm -hmm. like spears or the ochre samples or the mm -hmm. wrappings of the ochre or the hook that got the Mm. Go on around the tree would have been collected as art, do you think? Yes, I think yeah. so, because um, there's a bit of a revolution in Western art that moved, not revolution, a change in Western art so that you could use objects, common mm. objects, and, that. Mm. and this would have been no different. But the thing was, they were really tuned or crafted well. Um, I mean they weren't varnished or whatever but they really worked very uh, well and so anyone who looked at it would really go, oh that's, they've really cleaned that or they've sanded it or straightened it and um, and the thing that me, you know, you look at it and thought, oh I could make that maybe, you know, I'd give a go at doing that. Um, there are lots of other things to do with it, but um, it's an infinite thing, uh, that project. It's infinite because you can just keep going on and on and on. Um, there was someone I know who did a PhD about digging sticks um, in the Western Desert. And she talked about how people were using metal and things and whatever, a number of sticks and a number of people and she wrote a sociology picture of those people and how they were together and so on. Um, I'm sure she wrote quite a bit more, but um, there's um, a lot to get out of it. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. So, and that was enriching as the year, as the last couple of years of collecting um, was certainly enriching as we're adding, quickly adding lots of things to that. And then um, the Bernice Murphy came here uh, to visit. Um, in 1980, 1983, we put a set of. Um, 
paintings from David Malungi and a whole set of other men around honey. He put that into the Perspector exhibition in 1983. Um, and that was um, Bernice Murphy came up here to view the work, um, which was um, uh, pretty amazing. And like, some other people came up to have a look. They were saying, oh, yeah, just come up. I thought they'd see a few paintings and they realised, oh, this is really an integrated set of work. The Australian Museum has the set of work about honey. Okay, I was wondering that. And I don't know whether they ever bought it, uh, ever, have ever really exhibited it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a break, or? Uh, we'll take a break. Yeah. Yeah.